input and then uh, the head of trading peers will join us as well shortly. Okay, we're up and running. All right, Alex, why don't you take us away with a bit of a preview on the fundamental side of things and then we'll get Sam on to follow who could look at some of the charts uh, as well. Yeah, sure. Gonna First make of all, hi guys and welcome. Sam, if you can make um, Alex co-host. Yeah, I need to share one of Can you see the screen there? Yep, all good. Okay, so let's kick off with the non-farm payrolls for September 4th. Just wanted to start with a quick summary. Uh, the summary being the non-farm payrolls is unlikely to change the macro landscape with a dovish major trend in the, in the medium term. And the short-term overstretched positioning for the Euro USD rejects major resistance around 120, it happened a couple of days ago, but the dovish dip buyers will be lurking below. The ECB expresses concern about the current strength of the Euro, the ECB meeting for next week. I think that'd be quite important. So but what's expected for the NFP today, I'm gonna to leave Ant to sort of cover the event itself, but we're not expecting too much from this one. As Anthony was saying this morning in his briefing, uh, this mo this morning, the coming months are super important to the pace of the job growth uh, with vaccine developments and the expiration of the stimulus packages and so on. But we simply don't have that information at hand at present, which lessens the significance of this announcement today. We'll need to see more of that in the future. Uh, the consensus is for uh, 1.4 million payrolls. Uh, that's versus the previous of 1.7, which is actually lower. I'm going to go on to why I don't think that's a problem. The analysts' expectations are super wide again with 750k on the low side and 2 million on the high side. So it's going to be extremely difficult to get a big reaction out of this news event today. It's going to be hard for the number to fall outside those expectations. But if it does, obviously that would be super significant. Now, initial jobless claims have continued to trend lower throughout August, along with continuing claims, and the PMI sub-indices have also moved higher. It's likely that a, down, that a big downside surprise is limited, given the high-frequency data points, but analyst expectations are still enormously wide, as we discussed. Uh, ING's base case for today is for a below-consensus print. However, the capital economics forecast is more bullish. You can see there's not really much consensus around what research houses are forecasting for the event. Any reading that falls outside of the lower higher ranges will have bigger market impact, of course, but that's gonna be difficult. The unemployment rate is expected to fall below 10%. <clears throat> and Goldman notes that a resurgence of coronavirus did not produce a meaningful increase in layoffs in the Sunbelt regions based on the jobless claims data. I just wanted to talk about the pace of job growth sort of compared to the last recession. Now, looking at two, so on the left hand side here is the 2008 recession, on the right hand side is the current coronavirus. Let's remember what Powell said. Powell said the path of the economy will depend significantly on the course of the virus. And what does he mean by that? Well, looking at the 2008 recession, the recession happened in three stages. You had the first stage, we had mass unemployment. The second stage, we had a sharp rebound. And then the third stage, we had the sort of stabilization back towards the mean, the non-farm payroll mean being just under 200,000 over the last sort of 80 years. And so that's what we're sort of seeing here. We're seeing we had that, the only difference with the coronavirus is the unemployment was so sharp and so deep over the course of two months that the rebound happened a lot sharper. You can see the period of time here in 2008 was a lot longer. So this is why I don't think if, if we're seeing that the pace of job growth is slow, it's actually normal, you know, um, given where we are here. It happened in 2008 and it's normal. So that's why it's not a problem. And I would actually be expecting employment to start to return, the non-farm payrolls to start to return back to the median or, or the average back around that 200,000. We're a long way away from that. You know, we're still adding sort of 1.7 million jobs here. But that obviously depends 
more on what happens next with the virus. Uh, so there's three possible scenarios. You know, the number, number one, a vaccine is developed or COVID disappears entirely, which means the economies can reopen and that will cause a sharp resurgence in employment. So then this will come, come rising back. That's not going to happen just yet. Okay. Number two is COVID continues to linger without a giant second wave. And this fear remains prevalent in the economy and with the economy running below pre-virus levels for a prolonged period. And in this scenario, you would likely see employment sort of stable, continue the pace of growth to continue to slow, potentially even, even turn a touch negative like what we saw here back in 2008. And finally, a mighty second wave in the winter months happens without a vaccine, which even without a national lockdown, fear alone would reduce footfall in shops, keep businesses running skeleton crews. You know, anyone that's been out and about in the UK at the moment has seen that the economy is nowhere near what it was pre-coronavirus. Uh, all of this one way through shops and, and stuff like that, a lot of the shops still closed. This, in that scenario, would likely see unemployment rise. And so we don't have that information just yet, okay? But this is why I don't think today's report is going to be too exciting unless it falls outside of analysts' expectations. Again, I want to talk about the positioning, like what we spoke about over Jackson Hole. This is a positioning for the euro dollar. Uh, positioning, but positioning across the entire dovish trend is extremely stretched, with the euro USD long positioning now higher than the 2017 2018 Macron rally, which was back here. This is all time highs for the euro, positioning wise. And you can see it's how stretched we are. And this makes us vulnerable to a correction. You know, prices rallied almost 13% in the last 24 weeks from low to high since March, without much in the ways of a retracement. And in 2018, price rallied 17% in 37 weeks, including the consolidation prior to the rally. Um, so price is testing the 120 mark on the euro dollar. And in recent weeks, the rally has been losing steam. All this makes the euro dollar vulnerable to a correction lower in the near term, back towards that 11750, 11700 mark. And I feel that way across the entire dovish trend. You know, we saw that in the equity market yesterday, big pullback in the equity market. And I think that oh, this was another slide here from the euro. Sorry to. You can see this was Macron's rally here. We rallied up, and this is a weekly chart. You can see the stochastic here reached in 97 on the weekly time frame before it started to roll over, and we got this pullback. Well, look where we are now. Look, we're back up here at this 120 mark, which was where we were back here. And the stochastic again has reached that 95 area. And it, are we going to pull back here? I'm not saying we're going to change trend, but just a little bit of a correction there. And I expect that across the entire Dirish space. So conclusion then, all in all, is the non-farm payroll doesn't change the current narrative of the medium, medium term dovish view. If, if it's worse than expected, then this strengthens the Fed's dovish view to do whatever it takes to support the economy. So if the non-farm payroll is worse, then the Fed are just going to do more stimulus-wise. But if, if it's better than expected, then the Fed will remain on its current path uh, with many more tools left to be unveiled in the future. So my sort of view is, as it has been, you know, for months now, is the dumbest trends continue over the medium term. Overstretched positioning may cause a correction, which is just by the dip, in my view. And that'll be the same across all of those assets. Careful, Alex. You start saying by the dip and uh, Sam's going to get a bit excited. <laughs> Um, but with that being said, then, is it appropriate time now to hand it over to Sam? And yeah, um, yeah, that's all I've got for today. Cool. Thank cool. you. Thank Alex. you. Thank you, Alex. Yeah, yeah. No, great, uh, great introduction. And yeah, the words by the dip uh, ring, ring loudly in my ears. Let's have a look at the charts and, and talk about those dips. Um, am I sharing the charts? Is that up? Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Go. Uh, in the office today. So it's, it's hard to, to get my bearings right. But the dip that we saw yesterday, 21 day moving average 
um, has has been hit across the board. The Dow here, twenty eight thousand. Look, these these markets. Uh, it's all about where we finish the week now, isn't it? You know, do we get a further sell off post these numbers? Finish below the twenty one day moving average in the Dow. Finish below yesterday's low, which is also the high of eleventh of August, which as well is that double bottom that we had at the beginning of the year. Find me a bigger level for the Dow if you can. Uh, it's all about that. And then to the upside, you can see today's high is just the lower Wednesday. So putting that onto the 60 minute uh, time frame, I think it's just been a bit slow here. So we'll keep it on the, the daily, but it's the same for, for both the, the S&P in, in having a look at, at that. You can see the 21 day moving average hit that yesterday was, was perfect uh, support. Just waiting for my charts just to load up. It has had a bit of a bounce since then, although it's now down on the day. That also uh, hit a key level of resistance, as did the NASDAQ. Uh, unfortunately, guys, my charts have just been a tiny bit slow here. So, And I don't know if you want to take over as mine aren't loading up. Yeah, sure. All right, let me go over. Cheers. Thank you. So yeah, I'll just pick up where where Sam was. So yeah, just looking at the the equity charts. I mean, I talked about this quite a bit in my in my briefing this morning, and I was looking at the the same as Sam. It's kind of like the the support that we found around the twenty one DMA. Uh, I think, as he said, where we close today is going to be quite key. Um, as I discussed, you kind of you've got the same technical point of the twenty one DMA uh, repeated in the Nasdaq as as what you would have in the Dow. And we're, we're obviously within striking distance of the moment. So that does, for me, leave under certain conditions, the NASDAQ a little bit vulnerable to the downside from a technical perspective, at least, uh, should this payroll report not be, I agree with Alex, uh, I think it's not a definitive game changer as far as I think the Fed have kind of shown their hand for the time being, and we might get some more clarity to that in the upcoming September meeting in two or so week and a half's time. But that doesn't mean that we couldn't act as a catalyst. And that previous area, that high in the NASDAQ future on the 21st and the support on the 25th that we found, we closed uh, or we reopened on that same level. I think that's quite key. And if we did break lower today, then uh, we definitely could see a run down to 11,500. Wouldn't be surprising to see perhaps a little bit of a deeper, heavier move um, of another 200 points on where we're at at the moment already. I don't think that's out of the realms of possibility uh, in that sense. Uh, but this, these are strong levels. So uh, I guess I'd prefer to see a break first to get a definitive answer of seeing that commitment either side rather than trying to be too aggressive here on the back of this. But uh, equally so on the Dow, uh, if I was looking at that, it's the same level really as what we were looking at this morning. It's key to look at um, again, there's, there is scope for a breakdown in price could open up a bit of a deeper drawdown in some of the sell off that we've had from yesterday. Uh, and then in terms of the movement back onto the upside, obviously the intraday high uh, would be an area to, to look at. And then the prior high that we saw uh, from the 31st uh, before then, I mean, I don't I don't think we're going to get back up to these types of areas today and, and on the back of payrolls. I don't really see that happening. Um, on the currency side of things, I mean, things have been awfully quiet this morning, but that's probably as you would anticipate. It's the usual nature of the pre non farm environment, I would say. Um, so currency pairs have been pretty sideways. Um, I guess if we're looking at the euro for a moment, um, we've had a, a, an area of consolidation defined by the pivot level, the intraday price activity. Uh, and then on the upside, kind of double top from the price action from uh, yesterday evening, you know, London time and this morning. And so really, again, on the downside, the key area will be around that pivot and intraday low uh, first thing this morning. Any further push down on the back of dollar strength, if we were to get a particularly strong all round report and payrolls, uh, then could continue that kind of what has been a trend, obviously, with the ECB getting a little bit nervous about the ongoing strength of the euro certainly would help things um, to the downside on the flip side a break above that double top then could then lead to a bit of a push up and i'd be looking up at around those areas to the highs we initially had uh, here back on the second so going back towards the beginning of the week uh, and then with the r1 just above 
in the in the cable again it's going to be dollar led story i've been i've just saw some source comments come out um a short while ago when we started the presentation um and i think it was a uk source saying eu needs to realize that what we're asking for is at odds with what the british people voted for we're not something we would accept and EU asked that we accept continuity of EU state aid fisheries and policy is simply not compatible with our status as fully independent country. So all of these Brexit comments at the moment, I think, are exactly what you would anticipate. There's absolutely no need going into a new round of uh, negotiations starting on Monday for you to be giving way and conceding at this point. I think at the moment, there's still a bit of time to the, to the more kind of hypothetical cliff edge coming in the early part of October for a soft deadline for Brexit. So I wouldn't expect anything other than the two parties to be quite far apart. So I don't really think this is really too much of a thing right now. But if you saw the briefing I delivered this morning, I would say there's a heck of a lot of speed bumps in the, in the, uh, in the near view uh, of the UK just uh, coming up as we go in towards October in particular. And so, yeah, fundamentally a good report here. If we can add to a little bit of the dollar um, appreciation that we've had um, really over the, you know, in recent trade after we had that initial earlier week continuation of the sell-off. Now it's reversed course a little bit. Um, that could certainly um, help a further breakdown here on the downside. And you can see we're just holding at quite a key level in, in the near term at 132.55. Um, gold, gold's been quite interesting. Um, I, obviously, it was a quite a big equity sell-off yesterday, but gold, not really that interested, <laughs> to put it mildly. Um, and you know, people look at gold as like the, the kind of indicator of general risk appetite and sentiment. And we had this, you know, if you were reading the press yesterday, I think people were getting a little bit ahead of themselves and pure panic about now. You know, it's the this is it. The bubble's going to burst. It's time for a big correction in markets. But I can see Piers has just come on, and I did see a comment from Piers earlier, and he was talking about, well, hang on a second. The tech names, which are massively stretched, have come off, and perhaps rightly so, given how radically they've rallied. Particularly, you know, some of those real pandemic-sensitive names like Zoom post earnings. I think they were up 25%. So if they come off 25%, we are pretty much scratch. But what has happened and what quite a few people have talked about is a rotation into actually what is, you could argue, a fairly healthy thing, which is just some of those battened down stocks, which have been hurt like Carnival or these kind of more ones tied to hospitality and leisure, which really got killed in March. But if we start to see a more broad based buying rather than just led by tech giants, well, you know, isn't that? Isn't that a good thing? But net net gold was not interested at all yesterday, which I thought was quite interesting with that, with the amount of coverage that the equity sell off received. Um, so gold here, um, I've got some levels here I've had on before that was marked up. Um, I guess downside, we've kind of flirted with, had a few attempts, fail breaks of pivot uh, intraday. You've then got the low that we printed uh, yesterday afternoon and then more encapsulating some of the near-term range that we've had really for the last two weeks of August. Uh, so that kind of area there encompassing in between, which is also the S1, is quite key to watch. Uh, and again, this would be contingent, uh, I guess, on some further carry through of dollar strength on the back of a, an all-round good report, which could bump down those, um, those currency markets uh, in euro dollar and cable uh, but one thing i'm quite interested in to hear is if now peers is on what does peers uh, if i can ask you um, what do you think about the equity reaction under different scenarios here for this payroll report if there is going to be any reaction at all like how how would you yeah. suggest these guys perceive a good report and its impact and a negative report and its impact. So I think what's important, I mean, you're talking about gold there, and it kind of seems uninteresting, uninterested over the last sort of 24, 48 hours when you've seen this big correction lower in some of these top level stock indices. And I don't think, I don't think this stock sell off we've seen in the last 48 hours, I don't think it's necessarily, it's not like a risk off move. It's a profit taking move. And it's profit taking from 
one part of the stock index, one, one sector, particularly tech. And the, the money, the cash that's being raised by selling these stocks is then being shoveled into different equities. Um, when you look at the S&P and obviously particularly the NASDAQ, it looks like, wow, massive sell-off. Wow, it's all kicking off. Hang on a minute, why is gold not moving? Well, it's because it's, it's not a panic risk off. It's just profit taking. The other big moves in recent months, of course, is the dollar, dollar weakness. And again, as we've hit September, you look at things like the euro dollar hitting that 120 handle and then a nice big pullback over the last you know, couple of days. So it's more, it's more like, uh, it's more like profit taking. I think people then kind of fit a narrative to what they're seeing. So they see this top market selling off. They go, oh, wow, are oh, the elections coming? Let's start panicking. But, you know, we know the election's coming. We knew that last week when the NASDAQ was ramping through new all-time highs. It's, it's not like it's different this week. So I think we're, we're, we're delicately poised now, um, looking into quarter four. Um, are we going to have a meaningful equity correction? And I mean across the sectors. Um, I don't see that happening necessarily um, unless you start getting some of these big economic data points showing that the sort of post-summer economic situation is going to be markedly worse than we've been hoping. You know, I think we've gone through the summer, lockdowns have been reversed and, you know, and I just think we've been a bit more optimistic about this whole COVID thing. And it's just that the, the harsh reality may hit in that all of this government support, furloughing and, and all the rest of it, when that gets kind of turned off, what's the situation look like? And I think until we find that out, I don't think you're going to get a major stock market proper correction. Now, this data that's coming, fine, this is about August. Yeah, fine, it's interesting. You know, in the US, some of that sort of furlough government help was switched off at the end of July. And fine, it, we, you know, I think this, this report today might be the start of a bit more concern about what quarter four looks like if the number disappoints. And I think if the number does disappoint big time, you know, let's say it's negative, then fine. I think you will see perhaps a, a bit of a risk off, which will be broad based stocks selling off, uh, gold going up, you know. Um, but then, you know, we've got, we got the Fed coming in a couple of weeks, right? And so, it, you know, the worse this data gets, well, then the more assertive the Fed will be um, with regards to their stimulus plan. So, here's you know, what, you were, what you were saying then, putting it this way, I was reading this morning about Rishi Sunak. Obviously, he was incredibly well received with how he initially responded with the size of response in Britain to COVID-19 in various different ways. But you've got the end of the sub subsidy program for the restaurant industry happening. You've got the ban on evicting residential tenants, rent in arrears is expiring in two weeks time. You've got furlough ending in October. You've got a soft deadline for Brexit in October. You've got mortgage borrower holidays coming to an end. It's like, can the government realistically not continue these things? I know there's political pressure internally. What I'm saying is, if you were to think about this, other European countries like Germany, I know that fiscally they've got perhaps a little bit more wiggle room, but they've extended now into next year. Macron's come out with a, we're already in a fairly precarious situation, but let's just do another 100 billion because <laughs> I've, got, I've got to get re-elected in two years. Won't, won't Britain simply just... And, and for an equity medium term perspective then, to stop it seeing a severe correction, can, can they unwind these this soon? We're just about to go into the, the fall. Yeah, this is, I mean, this, this is a big, you know, this is the big question. I think that's a 2021 scenario. You know, I think governments will extend if they have to, this stimulus, you know, the, the money, the amount of money has just got ridiculous. You know, we're already into craziness territory when it comes to the amount of government debt they're going to take on to, to kind of to, to, to perform this kind of support act. And so what's a little bit more? It's, it's you know, it will happen, but it's not sustainable for for the long, not the, well, for the medium term, never mind the, the long term, right? So, you know, I think stocks have come off in the last couple of days. It's profit taking because we're coming to the end of the summer. You know, what's going to happen? Is the economy going to crash again? Are governments going to come in and support it? These are a bit unknowns, but people aren't ready to hit the panic button 
I mean, investors aren't ready to hit the panic button yet. We need more clear information. And, and perhaps this will be the first glimpse of, of that. Um, so, but I'd say today, look, you've got to think about what's happening. You know, non-farm payrolls triggers quite a lot of short-term movement. And whether it changes anything in the long term, I, I don't think it really does one single number. So here today, I think, look, the dollar has strengthened in the last 48 hours. And so I think just looking really short term, you know, dollar weakness um, of bad data could be a good trade. Um, and then looking at gold of bad data, you know, gold, that there is some pent up sort of potent upside potential given what's happened to stocks in the last 48 hours. So perhaps gold higher off bad news might be uh, an interesting trade as well. But I think this will provide short term volatility. You know, I think, I think in the end, though, this payrolls figure will be forgotten about by the time we get into next week. Yeah, agreed. And uh, just a final point, just in case Alex uh, didn't mention it, it's about the census job, temporary job hiring. I think that equates to about 240,000. Uh, and that's due to continue on through into September's data as well, before then it's kind of falls out into October, which coincides with a lot of that whole idea about the COVID situation and the vaccine development, where that is, that will dictate then uh, the government's course of action, I guess. But look, we've got literally a minute. I'm going to turn the squawk on. I'll play the release via my mic. So you'll hear the information come out. I'm going to share my screens so you can see the initial reaction. But for the guys here, feel free to jump on as and when you feel appropriate. Yeah, thank you. And just uh, obviously 20 seconds or so to go. Just a reminder, the CAD data out at the same time. So any CAD traders be double wary uh, in literally 20 seconds or so. Ten seconds. One spot three seven one million. One spot three seven one million. Slightly below the expected. One spot four unemployment rates. Eight spot four percent below the expected. Nine spots eight. U six fourteen spot two percent down from the price. Sixteen spot five participation. Sixty one spot seven up from the price. Sixty one spot four. Average earnings month on month, 0.4 above the expected 0%. Year on year, 4 spot 7 above the expected 4 spot 5. Turning to CAD employment change, 254, 245 spots, 8,000 below the expected 275. Full time, 205 spots, 8,000 up from the prior 73 spot 2. Part time, 40,000 down from the prior 345. Returning to the US data, private payrolls, that's one spot, 0 to 7 million. Manufacturing, 29,000 below the expected 50,000. Government, 344,000 above the prior 301,000. Cap wages, that's plus 6% year on year compared to the prior 5 spot 7. In terms of reaction to this data, not seeing too much movement across US equity futures. Treasuries have seen a touch of downside, and the dollar that has just moved back into positive territory. In terms of dollar cap, that's very little moved on this release. All right, well, I'm just going to turn the squawk down for a second. But yeah, the headline reading was pretty much about as in line as you get as far as non-farm payrolls goes, 1.371 million. The unemployment rate was actually 8.4%. 8.4%. Expectations were for 9.8%. So actually, you had a little bit of a dollar pop there initially. You can see that on the, the currency charts. It's reflecting that in the top left-hand corner in euro, dollar, and cable. But both have held those levels that we were looking at technically. Equity markets had a little pop up and the yields popped momentarily. So all reacting to kind of, let's say a worst case has not materialized uh, and with the unemployment perhaps just causing a few, raising a few eyebrows. So that's the initial take. But overall, this reaction is in the initial um, aftermath, very muted. Any other observations, guys? 
And yeah, hi guys. Yeah, no, I think the unemployment rate, that, that's a you know good good number there. You've got that brief dollar strength, but I don't think it's enough, isn't it? And it's like what Piers said, it's, you know, come Monday, Tuesday, people will have forgotten about this. And I think the markets are showing that for now. Sana, I'll just see your question on the YouTube channel. What do I think about equities? I, I think, you know, it's, it's a good opportunity, especially if we finish above the 21 day moving average today on the week to actually get in again, uh, to be honest. I wanted 3,400 in the S&P. That didn't quite happen. The 21-day moving average in the NASDAQ and obviously the others did happen and 28,000 in, in the Dow basically did. I think if they hold, uh, especially into the, the back end of this week, the volume's going to start to pick up and uh, die down, I should say, and, and that would help. But yeah, relatively, you know, I mean, forgettable non-farm payroll reading, I would say, which which I don't mind for, for stocks. Yeah, I, I add to that by just coming back to the points we were talking about before, about this stock sell-off that we've seen in the last 48 hours being not the risk-off sell-off, but just a more rotation of assets that are those risky tech names that have been through the roof in recent months and then into perhaps some of those lesser loved, um, you know, more COVID impacted stocks. Um, I think this unemployment rate definitely the most interesting number out of the whole lot and obviously it's, you know on the face of it it's, it's kind of crazy to say you know it is 1.4 percent better than expected um, which in any other year would be an absolute extraordinary beat yeah. but obviously in this year it's like well pff, whatever it doesn't really matter but it is a strong you know it's, it's a better than expected unemployment number um, now, um, you know, with that equity space, then I think that's enough. That's enough reassurance in the short term for us not to see this stock market correction turn into more of a broad-based risk-off. Do you see what I mean? So I, I think that the the sell-offs in the top-level indices can probably stabilise. And if not now, certainly into the end of this week, i.e. into the end of today, um, I think these stocks can, can stabilise and maybe next week there can be some, some upside. So I, I don't think, you know, that's a strong enough unemployment number to just calm the nerves. People are beginning to get a bit carried away. Hang on, stock market, right. Oh my God, the election's coming. You can feel some jittery people were beginning to jump on that bandwagon, and that might have led to a bit more of a broad based risk off. But I think that unemployment rate number is probably enough to just calm that. Do you see what I mean? Yeah, I can. So I'd like to just talk about the dollar as well, just quickly. I think it'd be interesting to see whether that profit taking sort of continues here with that dollar strength. I think with the ECB next week, that that 120 is going to hold in the euro. And the fact that it wasn't super bad and the unemployment rate's better than expected, maybe the maybe the euro sort of strengthens back up towards that 120 before the ECB meeting. And I think that'd be really interesting for next week. So I think the 120 holds. Um, so I got sort of a, I'm a little bit on the fence with the euro at the moment as to whether this, if this correction comes back down towards sort of 1750, 700, Long weekend, as Anthony was saying this morning, I'll definitely be a buyer down there. Um, pivot just holding at the moment in the euro. But I think there's definitely an argument for the dollar to continue to weaken back up towards 120. It's just whether that's going to be sort of now or wait for lower prices down towards that 1750. We're just testing the pivot again. So I'm sort of waiting and watching and, um, and make a decision probably sort of next week as to whether to go long maybe tuesday wednesday or whether maybe the back end of next week back up towards that 120 i think that's a good risk to reward trade cool. yeah i agree can i add to that just on the technical side sure. um it's such a good channel um i don't know if i can share my screenshot man can i yeah sam i think you need to do it as host um there's such a good channel on the euro dollar looking back over the last sort of five weeks um this unemployment rate number maybe just about strong enough to get the dollar strengthening to bring that euro dollar down onto the bottom side of the channel it's coming in around about the 118 handle um so yeah i can't bring sam can you give me sharing rates um, yeah, just while we're waiting for sam to sort that 
uh, and while um, Piers will go on to explain that that move, can uh, if you've got any questions at all, do you'd like for any of us to start typing them away? And whilst um, Piers finishes off this explanation in the currency pair, we'll um, we'll pick those up after. Yeah, Piers, you should have rights. Uh... Ah, yeah. Can you stop sharing your screen and, and then I can uh, take it? Yeah, all yours. Thank you very much. Yeah, so this is this is what I'm talking about on the euro dollar. Um, so I've, got, I've just got this looking back over the last month. Basically, we had that big dollar weakening phase. I mean, if you go if you go further back, that big dollar weakening phase. So we're going through the, the, the kind of middle part of the summer. And then we've had this slight consolidation as we'd been approaching 120, but still that kind of shape higher. And we've got a great channel here. And I was just talking about, you know, anything around this 118 handle. Um, as we, if we move lower here, you know, perhaps we're going to pick this up start of next week, maybe. And I was just saying that that unemployment rate being better than expected, bit of dollar strength which takes this currency pair down, of course. And so looking for that area technically is particularly interesting. Um, but I just want to dive across to, to gold because um, we were talking there about how gold's been a bit unloved as stocks were selling off, gold wasn't going higher, you know, what's going on? And we've explained why in terms of it not being really a risk off. Um, but of course, slightly better than expected data here. We kind of picked up a nice um, resistance test there. Um, just on the top up at 1956 and just kind of heading to the downside now. But if we, if we look a little bit further out, then um, again, a bit of a sort of bit of a, a kind of pennant sort of wedge um, situation. If I draw a couple of uh, lines in here, just to kind of pick out what I, what I mean. And so certainly on the bottom side of this is, is particularly interesting. And, and that, you know, we may well get a test of that. And, and you know that low point that we had from from yesterday is just below there. So technically, gold's an interesting point here. Uh, it'll be interesting to see if the dollar strength can just tip this down below this this wedge, and maybe we can see a move down, you know, more towards testing that low point um, of the week. Or oh, sorry, low point not not this week, last week, twenty six. Um, so just a few technical points there on, on gold. Okay, so I, I can see a few questions. So how about like I, I act as host and then you guys can pick it up. Um, I've just re-entered my Tesla long for long-term position, multiple exits. Any words of advice from the Amplify team? Piers, have you got any Tesla exposure? I do, not have, I do not have Tesla exposure. Um, it's one of those ones that I've, being honest, I've always, I've always missed it. Um, I, I get the long term for sure. Um, you know, I, I, I think Tesla are going to be, you know, they, they've been the pioneer. All right, fine. Every other car manufacturer is now catching up. But, you know, I think Tesla definitely have a place, very large place in this more electric vehicle world that we're going to live in. And so I get the long term. It's just that on that short term, there's so much volatility. You've got the Musk. Elon Musk risk with that trade, you know, you never know when he's going to tweet something and get into trouble. And so it's a dangerous one, but yeah, if you can pick up longs, you know, down the bottom end of its very large range, then, then fine. But you just got to have some, some balls of steel, so to speak, because there's going to be a lot of whips or action. And, and if you're prepared to ride through that, then yeah. Then sure, I wouldn't, the, I wouldn't risk much on it. I, that's, a, that's a small position trade. Is that the ball of steels that broke the unbreakable car? <laughs> uh, uh, isn't it? Piers, I think you should do a little do a little dance on camera for us and maybe my <laughs> stock price will start going up. <laughs> uh, no one wants to see that. I do, actually, to be fair. <laughs> okay. Um, there was a question about silver. I know there's a lot of people talking about silver. Um, it was almost outperforming gold. This was during that pre that period of a couple of weeks that we had when gold really exploded through 2000, got almost up to 2100. Silver was outperforming even that big move. So guys, I don't know if there's anything technically you you can talk over on, on silver chart. 
maybe one for you, Sam, if it's... Uh... Well, yeah, if, if I, my, my charts aren't loading up, but if you want to get yours up, I, I can talk through what I think. Because I do think uh, overall, longer term, silver and gold do go higher. I still think there's actually a tiny bit more downside uh, to come a uh, short term in both of them. Uh, so I would be be looking to to load up on some sort of longs around the 25 region, which you've got on your left hand side, you've got that little circle just before the 38.2. I, I, I would like price to come to there. And that's really where I see uh, a good opportunity to get back in again. Uh, and with gold, I'd like a little push lower to then load up again uh, on on that move. If you have a a look here you, you see i mean on the monthly you've got those highs well where were they from around sort of just above 1750 uh you know if you go back on that monthly chart if you draw up a, a line just a, it looks like it's around sort of 1800 maybe just a bit lower, lower there we go yeah around around there would be fantastic obviously we had a, a great push not too long ago that took us way above that so anything around there you know I'd, I'd snap your your hand off for it I don't think we we would get to that but down to yeah you know 1874 1880 I, I think is going to be still a nice nice trade for that but so for both for silver and gold I expect there to be a tiny bit more of a move to come it, the, the, the trend line peers had on recently we just got a test of that um so a break of that maybe to flush out uh, a couple more uh people that are still long to then get in buyers a bit lower down is how i see that happening okay then uh, another good question which will give me an opportunity to kind of lead on to talk about amplify a little bit but is there any chance for us to see your track record very interesting for retail traders like me and others, I think. Well, well I, I, yeah, yeah, it is. I mean, one yeah. thing I see I was, was thinking of doing, um, now it's back in September, markets are moving, is start putting out some, some well, every trade that I sort of take for the month of September. I mean, I'm away Monday to Wednesday, but I'm more than happy to, to do that and, and put the ideas that I'm looking at on, on Twitter in the morning. Um, and I'm sure Anthony in a moment will we'll go through our Twitter account. So I'm more than happy to sort of put my neck on the line, take these trades, and it's a good learning experience for, for everyone else as well. So, yeah. yeah. So, I mean, one of the things I'll say on the back of that is that we have like a live virtual trading floor that we have via a private Zoom channel. It's got about 120 odd people in there. But Sam and Alex are sharing their trades all day, every day. Uh, but that's for the visibility of our own community. Um, and we're going to have an enhancement to that chat room, but entire platform that's going to be released in a couple of weeks time. So, yeah, I mean, that will be free to access for a period. And I'd say that's the best thing. Get in there, have a look what our traders are doing, actually watch them. And then uh, you'll be in a much better position then to really see the real tangible results of, of, of what we're doing from our best advice. But yeah, on that point, um, if you haven't already done so, if you, if you are new to Amplify, don't forget to check out uh, AmplifyTrading.com, which is our main website. Uh, obviously, there's different parts of our business. We are all based on the, the trading arm. Uh, so we have a smaller proprietary trading division where people trade our funds. Uh, the idea here being that we can give them the environment that they need to develop and grow. Um, and then from there on, we can facilitate their backing, but we also have an ability through our uh, connections in industry to place people in certain other bigger firms. Um, but uh, we do have a variety of different training programs. You can just go onto the professional trader program section here. And if you're a student, um, we are actually coming to the end of our run of uh, summer internship programs, but the training we do as students is very different. It's much more holistic using our own proprietary software doing a variety of different functions. But if you just want to get in contact with the team still to see how we can help, then if you're a student, just uh, feel free to do so. Um, on Twitter, as Sam mentioned, uh, you can follow me. Obviously, you're watching this, some of you on, on YouTube. Don't forget to subscribe to the channel. We have videos coming out pretty much daily um, from a variety of different members on the team. Um, so do check that out. I have a morning briefing one for the fundamental kind of global macro view every day. Sam has a technical setup one. We have guest speakers. Uh, I've got a, a great former bank FX strategist coming on to do an interview with me 
coming up in the coming weeks. We had an uh, options specialist last week. So some real value there uh, anyway that you can get straight away. Uh, but yeah, feel free to follow me on Twitter. I share generally uh, opinion, insight, infographics, things I find interesting. You can follow Sam, um, snorth19. And then you can follow Alex, Alex Clark FX. Um, and again, he's tweeting quite actively as well, just throughout the day. Uh, I would share Piers's Twitter. He tweeted today, actually. Uh, well, I'll, I'll show you guys. Uh, I think if you direct a tweet to him, uh, he'll reply, no doubt. <laughs> but um, he's less active. But the one thing that for sure, um, when he does put out a tweet, uh, it, it moves markets. So uh, definitely worth a follow as well. But yeah, look, guys, that's it. I'm going to wrap up the session now. It's been about 45 minutes. So um, absolutely thank you for everyone for joining us. Um, I hope uh, it was insightful. I hope you managed to take away at least something from, from the session about um, how we look at things, particularly fundamentally to incorporate, build out around perhaps the technical ways in which you trade. Uh, anything we can do to help? Um, Sam, I don't know if you want to just put your email um, in the chat and stuff, uh, and Alex as well. Feel free to drop those guys uh, any questions. Um, absolutely always happy to help. And don't forget to subscribe to the YouTube channel. Okay, guys, thank you very much, Team Amplify. Thanks a lot. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, guys. Thanks for tuning in, everyone. Have a nice weekend. If you're in the States, enjoy your long weekend. Take, Take care, care, guys. Thanks. Bye.